Hi, welcome to Changing Minds, the podcast that explores how the latest advances in psychology, behavioural science and neuroscience can be used to tackle some of society's most pressing issues. I'm your host, Nicola Rayhani. Over the last few months, we've become all too aware of the need to change our habits, from things like washing our hands, to wearing face masks, and even keeping our distance from other people. But habits are often automatic and subconscious, which can make it very difficult to change them. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can build better habits with Liz Barker, who is the Global Head of Behavioural Science at the Behavioural Architects. Liz, thank you for joining us. Hello, I um, hope you can see me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Hi. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, I guess one thing that people that we tend to think about when we think of habits is that they're kind of fixed and automatic and not very amenable to change really. So how true is that? Are there things we can do to kind of inculcate new habits or to get rid of unwanted ones? Yeah, um, let's start by looking at the, the definition of habits. Um, and it's, it's basically a learned sequence of acts um, that have become automatic and unconscious. Um, in response to the cues and triggers around us. And so if those cues and triggers change, then we might find ourselves doing different things. Um, if those cues and triggers stay the same, um, then we're likely to continue those habits. Um, so in that way, it can become very hard to break habits um, if we're in the same context. Um, but equally, if we're, we change the context, um, then we can start to build new habits. Um, so that I'm sure you like when yeah. So would that be a bit like say if you um, are taking some kind of medication and then you're in a different place and you might forget to take it or something like that? Exactly. Another really good example is um, simply brushing your teeth. Um, it's something that you do just almost without thinking um, a couple of times a day. And interestingly, in in lockdown, um, people find found themselves forgetting to brush their teeth in the morning because it was part of their leaving the house routine to go to work. Um, and you know, they, because that routine had been disrupted, they didn't have the same cues and triggers um, to, to do that behavior. So you can see in, you know, straight away that it is possible to, to change a habit. Hopefully they got some different cues and triggers from uh, people that they live with that they ought to remember to do it. Um, so, um, so you guys have, you guys do um, some work on helping people to change habits in at the behavioural architects. I was wondering if there was any particular um, cases that you might want to tell us about today. Yeah, so um, the science of habits has been a really big part of uh, what we do at the behavioural architects right from the start. Um, at the, we we've based our business around behavioural science. Um, you know, it's it's at the heart of what we do. Um, we've always seen um, understanding habits, how to break them, how to build them, as one of the key things we really needed to understand and be able to explain and help clients with. Um, so much of what we do, I think it's something like 45% of our daily activities are habitual. So, you know, if you think 45% of the work that we get from clients is likely to be habitual as well. Um, so, so, yeah, um, we, we've done an awful lot of work on, on establishing different habits. One of the um, ones in the last couple of years has been um, working with Oxfam um, to build a, a new hand wash stand um, for refugee camps. Um, now you might think that um, you know, refugee camps have all the facilities that they need, but often um, all that gets sent out um, in, the, in the shipment from Oxfam are latrine sets, um, which is you know, sort of very basic. Um, but often the, the sort of hand washing side of things, which is equally important, gets neglected. Um, and you end up either with no hand washing facilities um, or really basic flimsy ones, you know, like hang, hanging a jerry can with a rope from a stick and someone sort of has to pull it and get the water to come out on their hands. And, you know, I'm sure you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, that sounds really horrible. And like, wouldn't the water splash all over my feet? And, you know, all these kind of things. And yeah, it's exactly the same um, in refugee camps for people. They don't like using them. And so, you know, either, either there's no facilities or these, these really not very good facilities. So that part of um, what is an incredibly important behavior gets neglected. Um, you know, hand washing, we know from COVID-19 is really important for stopping the spread of disease. Um, and, you know, in, in refugee camps, it's not just COVID-19, it's a whole host of things. 
Um, I think it's something we forget often in the developed world um, that you know we, we need to, to keep hygiene um, really strong to prevent disease, but it's not because there are lots of diseases you know, we don't have a prevalence of, of sort of common diseases and diarrhea and things in our lifestyle, um, in our lives. Uh, we, we just, it's not really something we need to focus on that, that much. Um, but in refugee camps, it's incredibly important in the sort of cramped and um, crowded um, areas that they have to live in. Right. Yeah. So I suppose it's one of those things that we all completely take for granted, that we have a sink just next to the toilet and that actually for people living in these refugee camps that you've described, actually it's not a given that there's gonna be a decent hand wash facility wet next to the toileting area. So what- Yeah, what I think the other thing to do is, um, is that, you know, even if they, these refugees, they had a, a hand washing routine in their home or even, you know, in their home country, they've been completely um, sort of displaced from that home context. Um, and, and you know now they're living in, in a camp in a tent um, so even if they had good hand washing habits um, back at home um, they might not have, have been able to sort of re-establish those habits um, you know I'm sure you can kind of think you know if you go camping um, it's just a little bit more tricky um, to, to sort of do those things that you would normally just do automatically at home yeah definitely so what, so what exactly was your guys' role in this project? Like, what did you, was, what was your aim? Like, what were you, what were you contracted to do to help out with this, to help to tackle this so it, was a, it was a really unique project. Um, it was a team of people um, brought together by Oxfam, um, really multidisciplinary team. Um, and so we all had a sort of a, a role within that team um, to provide a, a sort of unique element of our expertise. Um, so we had um, designers from the Royal College of Art. We had a project designer that, you know, built barbecues, designed barbecues for IKEA, um, who, you know, really knew his stuff around, you know, how to manufacture things effectively. Um, we had logisticians. We had humanitarian aid experts that had worked in refugee camps all over the world. We had sanitation experts. Um, it was really, you know, such a sort of diverse group of people. Um, we were all, were all learning from each other, you know, sitting around a table going, really? Oh, I didn't know things worked like that. Or, oh, I never thought of it that way. Um, so I think we, we really, particularly at the beginning, we were all, um, you know, really trying to sort of give our, our sort of tuppence worth of um, input um, to create something that was going to be really strong. And so what, where, where does, I mean, I can sort of see how perhaps like someone like the IKEA a uh, barbecue designer is really helpful in actually designing the units. And he doesn't just do that. He well, does design other <laughs> I guess it, one thing that might be interesting for people watching this to know more about is actually where does behavioural science come into it? Because you might just naively think that once you have these units in place, that's kind of the problem solved in a way. You know, you put, you put the hand wash units where they are and now people will just use them. So is that kind of a naive assumption or, or is there more to it in, on the behavioral side? Um, I think we tried to think about behavioral science in every element of, I guess, the journey of, of a hand washing stand. So right from being ordered um, to actually being used in the, in the camp. Um, so if we start from the beginning, um, you know, it, it's very costly to ship stuff out to these camps. Um, so everything needs to be really, really compactly um, and efficiently packed. Um, so we thought about things like easy and cheap to transport. So all of these, um, all of these stands fit together very, very tightly into a single pallet. Um, and they can be added to a pallet of latrines really easily. So if you're, um, if you're a humanitarian, humanitarian aid, um, uh, project manager and wanting to order a new batch of latrines, it's really easy. It's, it's um, almost like a default um, to add these hand wash stations on. It's, it's not really something you need to sit there calculating very easily or umming and ahhing about the cost um, because it's, it's been made really easy for you to do. Um, we also kept them low cost um, and I'll show you some visuals a bit later, but um, when you see it, I think you'll be amazed that they're, the actual cost of one is under 50 pounds. Um, when you see, you know, how developed they are. Um, we also thought about have, making them really easy to um, put up and set up next to the latrines. 
you know, the, there's, there's camp stuff, but they have limited time and, you know, they don't want to be, they're not going to be interested in putting together something that's really complicated. Um, it has to be intuitive. Um, and then we also made sure that um, they were easy to maintain. Again, the camp staff don't want to be going about, you know, three times a day filling water um, or cleaning them up or mopping up um, wastewater or something like that, um, or replacing soap. Um, in terms of the actual um, users, we also tried to make them really attractive to use. So we put mirrors and we put messaging, um, which would sort of attract them and remind them to use it. Um, you know, and obviously the context as well, putting them right near the latrines, um, not, you know, not somewhere hidden away. Um, so they come out of the latrine and it's almost sort of there staring at them saying, come and wash me. <laughs> um, you know, so it, it's all, it becomes as automatic as brushing your teeth. Um, finally, we also trialed um, combining it with the hand washing training program. Um, so it was a, rather than educating people, which sometimes isn't really very effective. I mean, we all know that we should wash our hands, but sometimes it creates a little bit more of a driver um, to do so. If you think about COVID-19, um, they've been much more sort of trying to make people feel socially responsible that, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, important for them to wash their hands to protect other people. Um, so there's, there's lots of sort of trials like this. And one of the more effective um, initiatives to get people washing their hands, particularly in the developing world, has been to focus on the idea of nurture. Um, so looking at mothers particularly who have a child caring role um, and, and getting them to think about hand washing almost as a sort of good upbringing. Um, and you know, if you, if you make this part of the child's life, then they'll grow up with good manners, good hand washing um, uh, and good health, and they'll go on to be successful in life, which obviously as a parent is incredibly motivating. You know, every parent wants to see their children do well in life. Um, so this program had been trialed in lots of different countries um, around the world by Oxfam and also by um, a team at the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, so it was, it was, you know, we were fairly confident that it was um, effective. Um, so we teamed that together with the hand washing stand um, to try and see if that would make an impact as well. Right. So you, um, so basically, there's like behavioural sciences involved more or less at every stage of the process, from uh, the inception to the kind of ultimate um, sort of implementation in situ. So yeah, it's actually. I probably wouldn't have thought about that in advance about actually thinking about the behavioral science from the sort of purchaser's side and from the side, from the point of view of the people who are going to be responsible for putting these stands up in the camp, not just the people who are going to be using them ultimately. Um, it might be yeah, nice to see a few pictures. Have you got any, you said you might have some pictures to show us. Can we have a look at those? Yeah, I'll just bring them up on my screen now. Um, So um, as you can see, there were several iterations of the, the hand wash stand, um, you know, and, and these were sort of tested in different ways. Um, initially, I think there was um, the, the first version was just tested on our user team, on, on, our, on our design team. Um, so, we, you know, we, we stood around in a meeting room and, and sort of gave feedback on how we thought it was to use. Um, but then as it sort of gradually became more developed and evolved, um, we took a few prototypes out to one of the camps um, in Africa and um, got some initial user feedback, um, both from um, the people, the refugees, but also from the camp staff. You know, how easy was it to put up? Was, did it make sense? Um, and then just getting sort of, you know, some qualitative feedback um, from, from the, the refugees as well. Um, Did you discover anything in during, like anything in that process that was some kind of unexpected or th that you wouldn't have found out otherwise if you hadn't have done this iterative approach? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Um, one was that people really love mirrors. Um, you know, it, it's, it's currency in a camp and, you know, to be able to sort of check your appearance or maybe use them to trade for other things um, was quite enticing. So. The first version, the first few versions where they were just sort of stuck on, um, we found that a lot of the mirrors would get stolen easily. Um, the second thing was um, we, we needed to think a bit harder about how to adjust the height easily. 
um, because children often found it, you know, children under five just found it too high and they couldn't reach it well. So um, later on in some of the pilots we ran, um, we set them up in schools, but um, sort of cut off the legs. Um, so, so they were much lower and children could reach them. Um, and the final version has metal legs, but again, it, it's quite easy to adjust them and, and make the whole stand lower. Um, I'll just flip through to um, some of the messaging. So this is the, the sort of nurture-based program um, around you know, encouraging mums to get their children to wash their hands. Um, so this, these are some of the visuals um, sort of trying to encourage people to, to wash their hands um, based around these sort of more emotional drivers. Um, so you can see the little girl with her mum there. Um, she wants to, you know, please her mum and, and do a good job. And then finally, um, th you can see how all of the um, stands sort of pack together in a single pallet. Um, so, you know, there's, there's something like, you know, 20 there um, wh where, you know, even the legs sort of all sort of slot in um, so they're easy to pack up. Wow, yeah, really cool. Thanks for showing us that. Actually, it's kind of um, the um, the mum's magic hands thing is quite funny. I was in a staff meeting the other day and hadn't realised that I didn't mute my microphone and managed to yell at the entire staff meeting, wash your hands, as uh, while well, I was talking to my children. But I'm not, I'm not sure if mine was quite the most nurturing uh, instruction, but it gave everyone a laugh anyway. So how do you, um, you have all these different kind of insights that you implement on with these hand wash stations, but is there, is there any way that you can actually measure or quantify whether, whether these different interventions you're using are actually effective in, in, in encouraging people to use the hand wash facilities? How would you do that? Yeah, so once we'd got you know a sort of reasonably well established um design um i think it was like you know iteration four or something um we then um sent out a batch of uh, about uh, 45 stands um out to uh, a camp in tanzania um and set up a, a sort of initial trial so you know it's not it wasn't you know a huge thing but it you know it was a pilot um to initially test um whether it was effective um so we we had three arms of the the, the trial. Um, one was a control group where you know basically everything stayed the same. Um, they used this, the sort of flimsy uh, makeshift um, hand wash facilities that already existed um, and had the, the kind of standard hand washing training that they always had. Um, there was a second arm where we simply just installed a hand wash stand near the latrines um, but with no sort of additional um, sort of facilitation or education. And the third arm um, also ran the Mum's Magic Hands program alongside. Um, so we had these sort of tiered systems um, and we, we implemented that for, um, we ran sort of 60 households um, had access to 15 stands. So it's, if you think about sort of, a, it would be a group of tents um, with a, access to a, a small group of latrines with maybe one hand wash stand between them. Um, so that roughly accounted sort of for 300 people um, per arm. So you know, reasonable size for us to be able to deduce, um, you know, what, whether it was impactful or not. Um, we, then we had a mixture of qualitative and quantitative um, assessments. Um, so we really tried to get some um, structured observations um, of whether people were using this hand wash stand. I'm sure you know you can see that. Just asking people, are you using the hand wash stand? Isn't really a very effective way of measuring. Um, people, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of shameful thing to admit that you haven't been washing your hands, um, even in this country. Um, we all know that we should wash our hands. We know the reasons why, and yet somehow we don't do it. Um, so we really wanted to have a really sort of objective way of measuring. Um, so in a very literal sense, we had a researcher sort of carefully hiding behind a tree with, a, with a, um, a sheet of paper just documenting how many people were using it um, and whether they were using soap as well and any difficulties. Um, we, tried to, yeah, we tried to add on a sort of qualitative element as well of um, observational research. So looking at, you know, do people have any problems using it? Um, do they seem to be motivated to use it? Uh, do they use the mirror? Those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had this, this um, quantitative 
research, but we also had qualitative feedback as well. Um, so we asked, asked um, households how they were finding it, um, whether they had any things they liked or disliked. Um, we also asked um, the camp staff as well, you know, how easy is it to maintain? Um, are there any problems with putting it up or you right. know, it, maintaining it over the, over the sort of course of the month it was running? And um, was so, the observer in the bushes, was that, was that you or was that somebody else who had no, to? No, no, um, no, we had a whole team of people, you know, it's quite a large trial, so we had a whole team of people. We did, we did think quite hard though about when, because um, you obviously want it to be a fairly reliable um, time to, to observe. So we, after a bit of thinking, we um, decided to observe sort of between 6 and 9 a.m. in the morning, because on average, most people are going to need to use the bathroom early in the morning after they've woken up. Um, mm -hmm. So just these little things, um, you know, sort of take a bit of thinking about sometimes. This is all super interesting. I'm really conscious that we're um, we're getting close to running out of time. And I think that you had a video that you wanted to show us of the of the intervention. Would it be, could you show us that now? Sure. Um, so this is um, maybe one of the earlier iterations. It's not the final one, uh, but I think it gives you a good insight into the context of the camp and um, you know how people were finding it to use. It's a Reuters video. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. Hand washing is one of the easiest ways of controlling disease. Until now, this rudimentary system, known as a tippy tap, was the norm in places like the Duta refugee camp in Tanzania. Global aid agency Oxfam have come up with this hand washing stand as a solution. They say it's cheap to produce and can cut the risk of disease. When people don't wash their hands, they are likely to have diseases like diarrhea and other water and sanitation related diseases. And we know that hand washing can reduce the risk of diarrhea related diseases by about up to 50%. It's light, so easily transported in bulk and easy to assemble. Sturdy tripod legs support the 30 litre capacity water reservoir, even in floods or on uneven terrain. A drip tray and drainage system avoids puddles that attract mosquitoes. A novel one-touch tap minimizes contact area with the hand and dispenses just the right amount of water to encourage proper hand washing. Each wash with these taps uses up to 100 milliliters of water. It's very efficient. So you get around 300 uses, which would be a family of four using it uh, for a week, actually, or um, groups of people, large groups of people using it over a day. That means you only need to fill it once a day, which is important for management of something like a refugee camp. From the supply centre, we send out thousands of plastic latrine slabs every year for sanitation programmes. And the issue for them is they don't provide immediately good quality hand washing facilities. Our intention is to have this ready to go so that when you order the train slabs, you order this by default. So it's always going to be a hand washing facility where you're doing some latrine program. Following successful trials in Tanzania, Oxfam wants to start mass production later this year. It hopes the final cost will be around $40 per unit. Welcome to the... Amazing, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so how, I mean, just before we, I'm conscious that we're really out of time now, but it would be, I think it'd be really interesting to know how uh, widely has this been adopted? Like, are you, are these being rolled out in refugee camps um, around the world? Where, where else are these um, units being used? Um, so they're now in mass production um, in China, um, being distributed um, around different project um, areas um, that Oxfam's affiliated to. Um, and they, they are on order from Oxfam's um, catalogue. Um, so because Oxfam is such a big agency, um, other agencies tend to order from them. And they have a huge warehouse just out, outside Oxford um, where everything is stored. Um, so it's really exciting to see. Um, and, and the, the trial results that I was talking about before, um, they were really promising. Um, so the control group, um, are roughly around 70% of people were using the, the existing hand washing facilities. Um, but when it was teamed with um, the Mum's Magic Hands programme and the new hand washing facility, that went up to 94%. Um, oh, wow. And 
Uh, so quite, yeah, quite a big leap. Um, when, when we only um, uh, gave the hand washing stands, um, with, you know, without the additional training, um, it, it did increase again um, up to 78%. So even just the hand washing stand on its own um, lifted hand washing rates. Um, but combined with this sort of more nurture, emotional driver um, element of it, then it, you know, it was much more effective. Yeah, it's a really amazing project, very interesting. And I mean, almost you could have envisaged these things being put outside tube stations or entrances <laughs> to office buildings and things like that. I mean, no reason why they only need to be in refugee camp, right? Exactly. I, I, I did think of this just when uh, the pandemic was sort of kicking off um, in so February, March, and you know, everyone's sort of obsessed about washing their hands. And I was thinking, well, why aren't these in like the entrance of big office buildings and things? Yeah. No, definitely. Like it seems like it, you know, it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Um, we're going to have to call it a day there. But thank you so much for sharing that really interesting case study with us and um, for telling us about um, this work that you've done with Oxfam in building these hand wash facilities. Um, thank you for joining us um, to the viewers who have been watching. This has been Changing Minds. I am your host, Nicola Rayhani. You can find all the previous episodes of the Changing Minds webinars and podcasts at the following website. Thank you very much once again for joining us and we'll see you next time.